Amen. All right, check this out. It was a time of unbelievable peace. There was peace with man. There was peace with nature. There was no more earthquakes. There was no more floods. There was no more disasters of any kind. The earth had been totally renovated just like the Garden of Eden long ago. And that's because the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, was literally ruling and reigning on the earth. You you could actually see him with your very own eyes. You you could touch him with your very own hands. It was absolutely wonderful, totally personal. In fact, the people no longer lived to only be about 100 years old. Why, you were still considered a, a little baby at 100 years old. Longevity of life had returned. Mankind no longer fought with each other. War was a thing of the past. And there was no more fear of animals of any kind. In fact, the the wolves lied down with the lambs and the the cows fed with the bears and the lions ate straw like an ox. In fact, little children walked around with them as if they were pets. It was absolutely unbelievable. In fact, so much so that the horrible seven-year tribulation seemed like a mere distant memory. It, It was almost like it never even happened. And that's why when Satan was released from the pit a thousand years later, He was able, believe it or not, to still raise up one final rebellion against God. Even after all Jesus had done in restoring the earth, the people still thought there was something better. So they gathered their forces from around the world. They marched to overthrow the reign of Christ, but immediately they met their doom just like that. Fire came down instantly from heaven and totally devoured them all, and that was it. No more of that stuff. The book is Revelation. The judgment, of course, is... The final rebellion at the end of the millennial kingdom, if you can believe that. Now, you read that, and that's at the very end of the Bible, the end of the book of Revelation. And I don't know about you, but how many more chances throughout history does man need to get from God before he gets it right, right? And and, and think about this time frame. I mean, I can see here and now when people would be tempted to think, well, maybe Jesus isn't real because we haven't seen him. But here in this time from the millennial kingdom, Jesus is literally ruling and reigning in front of their eyes, literally for a thousand years, and they still don't believe, and they still think there's something better than him. It's called rebellion. As we saw in the text, God doesn't put up with it for a second. He's going to judge it as he's going to judge every other sin. Okay, And so once again, here's the point. You would think then that people would stand up and take notice when God warns them about this future coming judgment to the whole planet. It's coming, folks. Okay, you would think that people would rightly conclude, hey man, I better get right with God now so I don't suffer the coming judgment of God later. Okay, how many guys would say that's a good thing? All 14 of you, praise God, got a better consensus tonight. Anyway, but, anyway, <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's what you think, but what's the problem we've been seeing? Evolution, the lie of this world, the, the little G of this world, little God, Satan, has blinded the minds of people. They don't even believe in God. And those who would even, if you will, want to flirt with the idea of God, one thing they absolutely refuse to believe in is that God is a God who will judge, right? How many times have you heard this? Well, my God is a God of love, and he would never... Well, first of all, that's your God, which makes it an idol. That's not the God of the Bible, the one and only God. Uh, yeah, he does uh, judge sin. Uh, explain the cross then. What was Jesus doing? He was dying there for judgment, for penalty for our sin. Okay, God is a God who will judge sin. And folks, he judges planet once and he's going to do it again. And so in order to help these people hopefully uh, come to Christ, we're going to continue our study, the witness of creation. And once again, the theme is this. We are taking a look at the different evidences that God's left behind for us, showing us he's not just real, but praise God, that we really can have a beautiful, loving, intimate relationship with him through Jesus Christ. Anybody glad about that? That God didn't say, hey, I'm real, and just waves at us forever. No, he wants a relationship. He's made it possible through Jesus Christ. And he's shown us this amazing truth in different ways. The first way we saw was the evidence of an intelligent creation. Nothing is by chance. We all have been designed by the handiwork of God, all of creation. The second evidence was the evidence of a young creation. We have not been here for millions and billions of years. That is a lie. The third evidence was the evidence of a special creation. We did not come from the goo to the zoo to me and you, okay? A blob of gel from an ape that smells. We didn't, it didn't happen that way, folks. We came as a special creation from the hand of God to have a special relationship with him. Isn't that much better to get out of bed for knowing that? <laughs> yeah, okay. And that's the truth. In the last nine times, we saw the fourth evidence was the evidence of a judge creation. And what we've been doing is taking a look at the evidence that there really was a flood. What does that mean? That means there really was a time when God judged this whole planet because of sin. And he's going to do it again. That's what the flood's about, folks. Okay? It's not just the ultimate survivor program. Hey, no, he made it. 
Why did it happen? It happened because of sin and God would judge him. And we saw that not just because the Bible says so, okay, which is not a bad thing. That's where we need to start. But since we live in a skeptical society, we had to do our homework. And we saw the last two times the evidence of a glorious civilization says so. This was a literal real account. And what we saw, the amazing evidences of advanced technology in the pre-flood world and society, we've actually found their artifacts. We found that they were able to traverse all over the planet, just like the Bible says, long before Columbus ever showed up on the scene. And then we even found some astounding underwater cities, which is what you would expect if there really was a pre-flood civilization that got deluged uh, by a flood, okay? And so what that tells us is, shocker, guys, try to hold back your tears. Once again, evolution got it wrong. (laughs) Yeah, well, I know. Oh, whoa. I tell you what. Uh, excuse me. There never was a time. The exact opposite of what the live evolution says. There was never a time in mankind's history, okay, that when we, the further you go back, they say we were dumb apes dragging our knuckles on the ground. That's not what we find. You can say it all you want. You can teach it all you want. You can put it on the history channel and put it in the secular school system. But that's not the facts. That's not the facts we are being lied to. The people of Noah's day were highly advanced, exactly like the Bible says. Unfortunately, They scoffed at God's warning of his coming judgment, and they were destroyed. Sounds like today, doesn't it? And what does Jesus say? As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. People are doing the same thing today, and that's why we need to get this information out. Okay, But that's not all. The eighth and final evidence that we're going to take a look on a judge creation is the evidence of my family history. That's right, giant life forms. Thank you, Bobby. For that help there. Uh, giant life forms, okay? And the reason why we're going to deal with this is because you might be thinking this, okay? Put it all together, because I know you got all these memorized that we've done so far. Hey, preachers can dream, Holly. Okay. Uh, but anyway, uh, so you might be saying, okay, Pastor Billy, so it's pretty obvious there was a worldwide flood, right? We took a look at that, not just from the biblical account. We've been looking at the evidence all over the, the world. In fact, that's why there's so many flood legends all over the world, up to about 500 of them or so, okay? Uh, and this is why we find billions and billions of dead things buried in rock layers all over the world. That's the leftover remains of massive animals and dinosaurs and all kinds of creatures perished because of this flood. And that's also why the topography we saw of the earth is in the shape it's in. The mountains and the crags and Grand Canyon and all that stuff, that's from the flood and the waters and the mountains going up, the waters coming down, like the Bible says, okay? And and, and that's also because we find the evidence of a past civilization that really was here on the planet. We still find pieces of it here and there around the world. I get that, but wait a second. The same Bible that records for us that there was a flood, a worldwide flood, also says that at the time before and after the flood, that there were giants, the Bible says. In fact, the Bible also mentions something very interesting during that time of the pre-flood society, that these people lived nearly a thousand years old. You expect me to believe that? Yeah. It's called do your homework, folks. Okay? Don't listen to the skeptic. Do your homework. That's completely possible. Okay? And the first evidence we're going to see, there really were giant life forms, just like the Genesis account says, is the evidence of giant ages giant ages, okay? Let's take a look at that text in Genesis chapter 5. Is your opening text tonight? Genesis chapter 5, and uh, we're going to read verses 3 through 32 as we take a look at the genealogy here, okay? Genesis chapter 5, and uh, let's take a look at uh, how long did these people live before the flood, okay? Genesis chapter 5, uh, page 5 on my Bible. That'll help. Okay, Uh, verse 3, here's what it says. Now, when Adam had lived how old? 130 years, he had a son. Can you imagine having a kid when you're 130? Woo, wow. He's in better shape, though. We'll get to that in a little bit. Okay, Uh, and and, and in his own likeness and, and his own image, and he named him Seth. Now, after Seth was born, Adam lived, whoa, uh, what? Is that a typo? No, 800 years. And he had other sons and daughters. How how many sons and kids could you have 900 some years old? Probably a few, yeah. Can you think about it from the lady's perspective? How many times you? We just won't go there. I digress. Let's move on. We got a lot to cover. Uh, uh, And and, and he had other sons and daughters. Although uh, altogether, Adam lived 930 years and he died. Whoa. Well, Seth, he lived, uh, uh, after he lived 105 years, he became the father of Enosh. And after he became the father of Enosh, Seth lived 807 years, and he had other sons and daughters. And altogether, Seth lived 912 years, and then he died. Well, when Enosh lived 90 years, he became the father of Kenan. And after he became the father of Kenan, 
Uh, Enosh lived 815 years and had other sons and daughters. And altogether, Enosh lived 905 years, and then he died. Well, when Kenan lived 70 years, he became the father of Mahalalel. And after he became the father of Mahalalel, Kenan lived 840 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Kenan lived 910 years, and then he died. Well, when Mahalalel had lived 65 years, he became the father of Jared, that guy where you get the rings from, the awesome deals. <laughs> Wrong guy, Scott. I know you're thinking that. Then move on. All right. He became the father of Jared. Okay. And after he became the father of Jared, Mahalalel lived 830 years, and he had other sons and daughters. And altogether, Mahalalel lived 895 years, and then he died. Well, when Jared lived 162 years old, can you imagine having a kid when you're 162? Whew. He became the father of Enoch. And after he became the father of Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. All together, Jared lived 962 years old. Wow, and then he died. Well, when Enoch lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. And after he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. All together, Enoch lived 365 years. Enoch walked with God, then he was no more because God took him away. You crazy Christians are wacko. You guys keep talking about this rapture thing, but that's just an aberration in Christian history, only until recent times. There's no evidence in the scripture, certainly not in the Old Testament, that God's just going to take somebody away like that. Oh, I'm sorry, we just read an example. Yeah, Enoch. Uh, when Methuselah had lived 187 years, he became the father of Lamech. And after he became the father of Lamech, Methuselah lived 782 years and had other sons and daughters. All together, Methuselah lived 969 years old. And then he died. Well, when Lamech had lived 182 years, he had a son. And he named him Noah and said, he will comfort us. That's what his name means. In the labor and painful toil of our hands caused by the ground, the Lord has cursed. Now, after Noah was born, Lamech lived 595 years and had other sons and daughters. And altogether, Lamech lived 777 years and then he died. Now, listen to this. After Noah was 500 years, okay, he became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, how would you like to have a kid when you're 500? <laughs> 162 doesn't sound too bad. <laughs> Excuse me? Whoa. Interesting, okay? But according to our text, folks, as wild as this sounds, it's right here. And this is how we approach the scripture, literally, okay? The people in Noah's day, okay, not only were highly advanced, as we saw in other texts there, but they obviously lived a long time, right? And we, we left off there with a, a pretty close there to the account of Methuselah, who, by the way, can you imagine how rough he had in kindergarten, trying to spell his name, and the kids making fun of him, I can't get past the age, Right? Anyway, whatever. Uh, but Methuselah, he lived how long? 969 years old. In fact, that whole chapter, chapter 5 in Genesis, is dealing with, as you just saw, as we just read, nothing but the account of long ages, long, super-duper long lifespans, even Noah himself. Right Now, here's the point. Granted, on the surface, I must admit that living for almost 1,000 years seems pretty wild. Seems like a bold claim. Okay? But again, you just need to do your homework and check out the facts. Now, the problem is some people caving into the pressure of evolution, okay, just like the literalness of the six-day creation. Oh, no, it can't be literally six days. Okay, uh, really? So, so God can speak out of nothing and create the universe, but it can't happen like that. Okay, can't happen, you know, whatever. So, but, so the same thing here. It's like, oh, no, these can't be literal ages. And so even Christians, unfortunately, have caved into this pressure. And they say, okay, oh, okay. They come up with a theory. Um, it's a cultural thing is what's going on here in this text, right? Uh, uh, and, and here's what they say. They say, these ages are not to be taken literally, okay? Because back then, they say the culture of that day counted every month as a year, so what you really need to do is divide these ages by 12. Okay, well, it's nice to think that, but uh, it makes no sense. If you uh, check your math and bust out your calculator, uh, for instance, let's put your so-called theory to the test. Okay, the Bible says Enoch was 65 years old when he begot uh, Methuselah, right? So if you do the math according to this theory, uh, and divide 65 by 12, you'll see that, according to this theory, Enoch was five and a half years old when he became a dad. Yeah! <laughs> Excuse me? What's going on there? I, I don't think so, okay? Hello, these people really did leave, uh, live that long, folks. You don't need to cave in the pressure. 
And this is a classic example of just leave it alone. All right, you may not have the answers now. Just do your homework. Go search. God will lead you where you need to go. The evidence is there. Stop tweaking with the Scripture. Every time people, even Christians, tweak with God's Scripture, it messes up another part of the Scripture. And another, Just leave it alone. God doesn't lie, okay? And it actually, if you continue to do your homework, you're going to see, yeah, it really is possible for people to live that long. And once again, that's the importance of this text that we've seen uh, several other times before, okay? Genesis chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. In the Genesis account, there's a little nugget in there that explains how these people could live this long, okay? And God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water, okay? So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it, and it was so. And God called the expanse what? sky and there was evening and there was morning on the literal second day is what we see here okay but as we've seen this passage before folks if you recall the bible clearly says that when god created the sky or the atmosphere he did so by placing an expanse okay between the waters that were on the earth from the waters that apparently were in the sky or in the atmosphere, okay? And so this text, once again, gives us a clue to the pre-flood conditions in the atmosphere, that there was a certain amount of water that was in that atmosphere. And uh, we talked about that before. You guys remember that a little bit? Okay, now here's the point back to these long ages, okay? These pre-flood conditions not only explain why there was so much water that came from above for 40 days and 40 nights that deluged the world. Now, again, as we saw before, I think that the bulk of the water that flooded the planet wasn't just from above. It was mainly from below when the earth cracked up and it busted out from the springs of the great deep, and then a lot of that did come down. But there was still a lot that came from above, okay? So it not only explains that, but listen, it also begins to explain why in the world people lived, listen, so long back then, but they don't live that long today. Water in the upper atmosphere would actually keep your lifespan going for amazing results. Let's take a look at some of that evidence. Okay, what most people don't realize is that a certain amount of water surrounding our upper atmosphere would provide the right conditions for people to live long lifespans. And this is because they would have been protected from the harmful radiation that beats down upon us from the sun and shortens our lifespan. Okay, the sun does not just emit light. Okay, it emits harmful radiations in the form of x-rays and ultraviolet rays and gamma rays, etc., just like you get in a doctor's office, okay? And if you don't think that's harmful to your body, pay attention to the next time you get an x-ray. This is why they proceed to give you a lead line vest. That's your first clue. You know, it weighs 900 pounds and <gasps> you can't breathe. You sound like Darth Vader. Get it all. Okay, but anyway, it's really heavy, lead line vest. And the doctors stay right there and examine it. No, they run out of the room, right? Then they push the button nine blocks away, you know, something, right? Okay, x-rays obviously work great to see the inside of you, but prolonged exposure to them, danger, danger, okay? They can mean the death of you. And this is what's going on every single day with our sun. Even though we may not see it, we are being rayed to death, okay? Now, our bodies put up a good fight. Daily, our bodies designed by God are, you know, putting up a defense, right? Trying to bounce back from being raided that day, okay? But eventually, as you can see, uh, we lose the battle. Our bodies begin to uh, wrinkle up and shrivel up, break down and die, all right? But anyway, let's move on. Uh, but here's the point. A certain amount of water in the pre-flood atmosphere would have prevented this, okay? Big time, okay? And that's because not only does lead and not only does concrete help to block radiation, but so does water. Interesting. Wow. Therefore, prior to the flood, the harmful effects caused by the sun's radiation would have been shielded and the health and the life expectancy would go way up. Okay. And then when that thing came down and you lost that shield, what would happen to the life expectancy? It would go back down. And this is why when it did come from down from above that the people's lifespans, as I just mentioned, they came down too. If you look at the ages of the people after the flood, don't just read the account of how long they lived here. Read after the flood, it starts to mention their ages, and notice there's a huge drop-off, okay? The lifespans go from about 900 down to about 400, then to about 200 to about the average around 100, which is what we have today. But before the flood, you were about a, a kid at 100 years old. You hadn't even had your first child yet, according to some of those occurrences, okay? Just like the millennial kingdom, that Jesus is going to renovate the world back to Garden of Eden-like conditions. What's the thing that's mentioned there in the Old Testament prophets? Longevity of life. Okay, it's going to be reversed. He's going to fix it again. Now, we also see this actually uh, in examples, okay? 
Uh, lifespans can only be provided by the pre-flood atmosphere, but we got modern examples that when you shield yourself from the harmful effects of the sun, your life expectancy goes, uh, goes up. For instance, studies have shown that there's been a noticeable longevity of people uh, who live in steep canyons and valleys that provide a natural shield from the harmful effects of the sun, okay, have a tendency to live longer, look younger. And then there's a considerable jump in longevity from 1911 to 1951 when automation and transportation and production move people indoors away from the sun, out from the farmlands and communities into the big cities, into the high rises, factory buildings, and lo and behold, what are you, you're shielded from? You're shielded from the sun. And finally, this is awesome. Uh, this is an example of longevity. This is the Dickerson children. Now, this is a sad story, but it kind of fits with what's going on here. These children actually were seeking their way in an attic until they were teenagers. Now, that's horrible. That's abuse, obviously. That's gross. Okay, and there's a whole other story about it. You know, children in the attic, things of that nature. Okay, lock them in the way. But, but they finally got freed. Okay, and this is the point. Here you can see pictures from left to right. That's Connie Gordon, uh, of Connie Gordon and Glenda Dickerson. The, this is taken when they were 18, 15, and 13. It looks like they're little kids. But this is their ages after being locked in an attic for years and years, which again is horrible. Okay, but 18, 15, and 13. looks like they literally had stopped aging. Okay, they were shielded away the whole time. Uh, the children were still quite healthy and intelligent, but obviously the time they spent shielded away from the sun had an amazing anti-aging effect on them. Right? So if you guys want to stay looking young, don't ever leave the house. Moms and dads don't like that theory. You're 18, get out of there. And you're going to go get old and wrinkly like the rest of us. Nice theory. Let's move on. But anyway, if you guys can see, when you do your homework, okay, put all the facts together, look at the biblical account, but even look at some of the modern examples, I'd say there's no reason to scoff uh, at the Genesis account, right? Okay, you just need to do your homework, okay? You don't need to cave in pressure. You don't need to tweak the scripture. Just leave it alone. And yeah, it is possible for people uh, to live that long. The second evidence that we have giant life forms is not just giant ages, and we've explained that, but it's also, there's something interesting going on there too. Uh, it also produces giant conditions, okay? And this helps to answer some of the interesting things that we find in the fossil record, okay? We not only find in the biblical account that people live longer, that helps provide that answer, but we also find in the fossil record that there was huge, massive, giant life forms, and not just the dinosaurs, all kinds of life forms prior to the flood got stupendously big, much bigger than we see today, okay? And so the question is, once again, the Bible is the only source that we see that explains why things got so massively big back then and why they don't get so big today. Once again, it has to do with this pre-flood atmosphere, okay? A certain amount of water in that atmosphere would not only provide the right amount of protection for people to live longer, but it would have provided the right kind of environment for people and everything to grow larger. I mean, huge, okay? And this is because a certain amount of water in the atmosphere would help to create a global greenhouse effect that would have made the environment a much, much healthier place to live in, number one. It would have been subtropical with greater air pressure that in turn would have made everything not only live longer, but would have made everything grow like weeds, okay? Everything, including people, Lord willing, we'll see that uh, next week, okay? But we also see, coupled with this next factor, wow, what an amazing existence it was, okay? Not only the upper atmosphere would help create this greenhouse effect that would help everything to grow huge and grow like weeds, but apparently the oxygen content back then was greater, and when you combine the two things with greater air pressure, greater oxygen, greenhouse effect, amazing things on the human body. Let's take a look at that. And that's because thanks to oxygen bubbles found in trapped in fossilized amber that was created at the time of the flood, not millions of years ago, right? They've actually tapped into them in these air bubbles and they've measured them, okay? And they've actually found that the pre-flood world's atmosphere contained much more oxygen than what we have today. So they know that. That's, that's easily demonstrated. And so if you combine these two features with more air pressure and more oxygen, it would have had an amazing effect on the human body. Okay? One guy said this, just breathing would have been exciting. <sighs> yeah. Okay? And that's because under these conditions, okay, not only does your hemoglobin take on oxygen, but the plasma in your bloodstream would get oxygen saturated, which means you could, listen, run for hundreds of miles without ever getting tired, okay? Therefore, Adam and Eve did not need a car. They just ran to grandma's for Thanksgiving. <laughs> Wait a second. 
Uh, but of course, they didn't have a grandma or a mother-in-law, which is, by the way, why he's called paradise. <laughs> Listen, come on. I know my wife's not here, but let's set the record straight. She's got great in-laws. Yeah, let's just move on. Uh, anyway, but seriously, more air pressure and more oxygen would help explain another problem that the evolutionists have with the dinosaurs. Once again, the Bible gets it right 100% of the time. You see, they can't figure out how in the world dinosaurs got so big when they have such small lungs and small nostrils. They're just not big enough for them to breathe adequately, okay? For instance, this is one example. An 80-foot apatosaurus had the same size nostrils as a horse, okay? Here's the problem. How in the world is an 80-foot animal, 80 feet, folks, going to get enough air through the nostrils the same size of a horse, okay? As one guy said, he'd be sucking in air so hard uh, just to get a breath, he'd set his nostrils on fire from the friction going on there. It ain't going to happen, folks. <laughs> okay, that's the problem. But that's just it. In our atmosphere today, an 80-foot apatosaurus could not breathe adequately, but in the pre-flood world atmosphere with greater air pressure, more oxygen, hey, they could. Interesting. So even that fits the account. And then, of course, you got examples. We know, folks, that when you have more air pressure, more oxygen, amazing effects on the human body. And that's these things that modern medicine is uh, finally catching up with called hyperbaric oxygen therapy or chambers. You heard that? A lot of people starting to use it. Okay. And what they do is they place people in these chambers called hyperbaric oxygen chambers that provides an, uh, not just more oxygen, but pressurized oxygen. And they subject the human body to it over time. And not so surprisingly, uh, the results are amazing. They've been able to heal Lyme disease, strokes, migraines, multiple sclerosis, autism, abscesses, certain amounts of hearing loss, all kinds of things, just to name a few. In fact, so promising are the results that even some celebrity and professional sports teams are using them to provide rapid healing for their players. If you're going to pay a guy $40 million to chase a blob of pigskin down a field, you want him on the field, right? And so they're using this because it provides rapid healing. Healing. Another example is that, remember that? Remember back in the day, the baby Jessica thing, the little baby that uh, uh, fell down in that well? Remember that? You guys remember that? woman? was that, but what, in the 80s or something like that? And uh, they finally dug her out, whatever, and uh, she had her leg twisted up like this or something like that, up right here, and basically when they first, they had two doctors, I guess, came on the scene, and, and one of them was saying, you're just going to have to amputate, and one guy says, no, wait a second, let's try this hyperbaric oxygen chamber. And she was all just black and blue and whatever. And they put her in the hyperbaric oxygen chamber. And uh, in just a, a, a short amount of time, uh, she basically, the, the pinkness came back in her leg. And she was able to say that. I think all she lost was one little digit on her toe or something like that. Very rapid healing when you use this technology. Okay, now here's the point. Can you imagine a whole world like that? Can you imagine a whole planet being a hyperbaric oxygen chamber 24 hours a day? seven days a week, okay? That's what the pre-flood world was like. That's how Jesus is going to renovate it if he does the same thing to the atmosphere during the millennial kingdom. It's going to be absolutely awesome. One guy says, man, you wouldn't need a hospital. You get healed up before you even got there, okay? It would be awesome. It's going to be awesome. In fact, one researcher decided to take it a step further and duplicate it, put it to the test. Isn't that what we're supposed to do? Isn't that science? He put it to the test, this pre-flood atmosphere, and he subjected various animals to it. And of course, guess what? They got really big, okay? Let's take a look at that. Is it possible that environmental conditions of past ages favored the development of giants? Certainly we know from fossil evidence that some species, like dinosaurs, grew many times larger than they do today. A supporter of this thought-provoking and controversial theory is Dr. Carl Bohr. Optimal genetic expression means the best that the organism has within the DNA is expressed because of favorable atmospheric conditions. A thinning of the ozone layer means less protection from the ionizing radiation from space and less protection for plants and animals. Being interested in Earth's original conditions, after 35 years of research on those parameters, I've attempted to reconstruct that context and in so doing I've had our engineers build a biosphere that doubles the atmospheric pressure that increases the electromagnetic energy that increases the ratio of oxygen but not to the level of toxicity that eliminates ultraviolet radiation etc 
And the experiments that we've run have been very gratifying. In our control scientific experiment, we have measured the effects of a pulsed electromagnetic field on biological systems. We have these Pacu piranha fish that normally at three and a half years of age are about this size under optimal conditions. Yet we have them now in excess of 20 inches, weighing just under five pounds each under these control conditions. We have succeeded in producing giantism at an accelerated rate. You know I want to try one on my wiener dog. Wouldn't that be cool? Who's laughing now? Right? Isn't that wild? Put it to the test. All of a sudden, things get bigger. Very interesting. Oh, by the way, uh, he said he was also able to triple the lifespans of fruit flies. Okay, and he was able even to reverse some of the negative effects of the curse. Listen to this. He was able to change the molecular structure of the venom of a copperhead snake into a non-toxic state after just four weeks in a hyperbaric oxygen chamber. Now, that's an interesting note because you'll have some skeptics say, well, what was the purpose of snakes or what was the purpose of mosquitoes or what was the purpose of this, you know, prior to, I don't see no purpose, no value, no, why would God say it's good? Well, maybe before the flood. There was a positive purpose. Interesting, okay? In fact, even NASA decided to put this to the test to see if they could utilize it for the space program. And one such experiment involved three scientists living in the ocean floor in a biosphere under the water protected from this oxygen the whole nine yards. They stayed in there about one to three months and quote, when, and this is from the report, quote, when they left, they were all middle-aged with graying hair and low libidos. When they returned, their hair was clear of gray. The wrinkles had started to disappear. And, quote, their sex drive had so increased that their wives complained about it to NASA. <laughs> That's the report, okay? It turns out that certain glands and organs were reactivated, and blood test shows unusual level of hormones, okay, that are normally associated with growth in young children. Okay, in fact, it was further speculated that what would happen if you took this knowledge and built a room with this kind of atmosphere and slept in it for eight hours a day? I'm not making this up. This is from the report from NASA. Quote, the man from NASA said, quote, for every day spent in there, one year would be added onto your life until you maxed out about 1,000 years old. How old was Methuselah? Nobody can ever live that long very interesting. Once again, I say, folks, you don't need to tweak the scripture. Take it to face value. God doesn't lie. Do your homework and you're going to find, yeah, that was really possible. Not only with giant ages, but it also explains the giant conditions, okay? Once again, read the Bible and just deal with the facts, okay? But again, you might be thinking, okay, so prior to the flood, there was obviously things that were conducive for giant ages and giant life forms. I see that, okay. Uh, but, but does that mean all life forms really got that big, not just the dinosaurs? Yeah, all means all, folks. And this is the only time I have uh, time for this one. We're going to take a look at the third evidence that there really were uh, giant life forms prior to the flood, and a lot of it was induced by this, okay. And that is the evidence of plants. Let's take a look at what kind of plants we find and what would happen if you put them to these kind of conditions, okay? The pre-flood world and its conditions have not only been experimented on humans and animals, okay, but it's even been used on plants, okay? They subject plants. All right, let's see what happens when we put these conditions on plants. Amazing results. Let me give you a couple examples. One is this guy, Dr. K. Mori of Tokyo, Japan. He started raising a cherry tomato plant in his basement. Not a regular tomato plant, a cherry tomato plant. You know the little ones you put on a salad, right? Well, plants need light, and this is in the basement, so he took a fiber optic cable and ran it down from the roof to the plants. And immediately his cherry tomato plant began to grow abnormally fast. And so he thought, you know, because it's in the basement, so it's shielded from the sun, but he was able to get light to it. Remember the pre-flood atmosphere. So he thought, well, you know what? I wonder uh, if the fiber optic cable is blocking out the harmful UV light, right? It's only getting good light, so to speak, okay? And so he put a plastic shield over the plant to further block out the UV light, and then he moved it into a laboratory. And then he decided to pressurize the stem of the plant with carbon dioxide, right? So now you're increasing the pressure. And he didn't do it with the whole plant, he just, uh, which would have been better. He just did it to the stem of the plant. The results were amazing. Listen to this. After two years, his cherry tomato plant was 16 feet tall and produced 900 tomatoes. 
They were still not done, though. And, and by the way, his tomatoes were the size of baseballs from a cherry tomato plant. They were huge. So eventually, they moved it into a shopping center. And they built an even bigger plastic shield over it and the scaffolding uh, to hold the branches up now. And the last report shared that his cherry tomato plant was now 40 feet tall, produces 15,000 tomatoes every single year. And as one guy said, that's not a tomato plant, that's a tomato tree. <laughs> Interesting. So you block out the harmful lights, you pressurize it. Wow, I guess it really does work on everything. Uh, that's not all. Another guy, this guy, Dan Carlson, he decided to subject a, uh, another uh, scenario to pre-flood conditions to plants. And he was able to produce gigantic results as well. Now, he was inspired by this text in Genesis. There's another little neat nugget that's going on here. And that's 2.6 that says this. But there was a mist, okay, a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. So scientifically, he put that to the test. And so he started misting his plants, okay, in, uh, with the healthy enzyme and incorporating uh, music of birds to open the plant stomata for uh, maximum exposure, Okay, which is kind of, that's a whole other thing. I think it's called Sonic Bloom, if you want to check it out, and be able to use the sound of birds. It's interesting why the birds always in the morning. Well, it, that, the music of the birds, the sound of the birds, opens up the stomata of the plant, and so that gives them the mass, maximum exposure. So, but anyway, so he put all that to the test, misting it, doing that, and the results were amazing. He was able to grow a purple passion plant that normally grows about 18 inches to a Guinness World Book record size of 1,300 feet. Amazing results. But that's not all. They were also able to grow a 1,458-pound pumpkin and giant vegetables that were still being eaten six months later without any preservative. So probably everything was much healthier also back then, and you didn't need all those preservatives, okay? One person stated, can you imagine if the whole earth was under these kind of conditions prior to the flood? All the plants would grow like crazy. And guess what we find in the fossil record? That's exactly what we find. Okay, let's take a look at just a couple examples. Trees today that only grow a few feet, the exact same trees in the flood, in the fossil record, they grow 100 feet. 10 times bigger if it was just 10 feet, but this is a few feet, so it's probably 20, 30 feet, 30 times bigger. Huge, okay? Massive, massive, okay? One Arctic explorer uh, found the remains of a saber-toothed tiger and a 90-foot plum tree. How big were those plums, right? Oh, by the way, what in the world is a plum tree doing in the Arctic with a saber-toothed tiger. Oh, like we've been lied to again. We saw that before. Uh, fossilized ferns have been discovered the size of trees. Ferns, the size of trees. Horse tails have been found over 30 feet tall. Fossilized cattails, cattails have been found that are 60 feet tall. Six-story cattail. Absolutely amazing. And they even found a tree stump in Texas that was 40 feet in diameter, which means the tree at one time is estimated to be about 1,000 feet tall. How big are the sequoias? 300 or so? That's triple that size. That's a big tree. And that's why the people would say, well, gee whiz, I guess with this pre-flood environment, it really would produce giant life forms of all kinds. Interesting. It's almost like, I don't know, I'm sorry, I don't know, maybe you guys are starting to see the same pattern, but it's almost like if you just leave the Bible alone, you take it at face value, stop insinuating like God doesn't know what he's doing, or he's like man and he lies. He doesn't. Man is the one who lies, okay? You just do your homework, and sure enough, it fits right down to the T. You don't need to cave into pressure, okay? But you might be thinking, oh, go in a second. If the plants got bigger and the dinosaurs got bigger, did the people get bigger? Oh, yeah. That's what we're going to do with Lord willing next week. It's all about huge people. People got not just twice the size of us today, three times the size of us today. And there's skeletons that they find that the Smithsonian is so desperately trying to hide away from us. But some have leaked out. But we'll get to that, Tom. That's right. Lord willing. Next week. Let's go ahead and let's... Well, hi. This is Pastor Billy Crone of Sunrise Baptist Church and Get a Life Ministries. And I hope you enjoyed today's study. But in closing, before you go, let me ask you one final question. If you were to die today, are you sure that you go to heaven and not hell? You see, here's the problem. The Bible says that nobody automatically gets to go to heaven. And that's because God is holy and we are not. The Bible says that the wages of our sin or our unholiness or the wrong things that we have done have separated us from God. And the wages of our sin or unholiness 
uh, means that we deserve to die and receive God's judgment to go to hell and not heaven. In other words, we're disqualified for heaven. And that's because God being holy and us being not, the two cannot mix. So what are we going to do? Well, that's bad enough. The other problem is we don't even want to admit this dilemma, even though God already knows it all. And so out of love, God gave us something called the Ten Commandments to show us that we're really disqualified for heaven. We're not holy. We're not perfect like him. Uh, let's take a, a look at just a few of those uh, here today. Uh, the Bible says, the Ten Commandments says, you shall not bear false witness. That means lying. How many of you ever told a lie before? Well, those of you who didn't raise your hand, you just did. Okay, let's be honest, folks. Let's not tell another lie. We've all lied. Well, believe it or not, that disqualifies you for heaven. That's how holy God is. He is the truth. He does not lie. And so that makes us a liar. Another of the Ten Commandments says you shall not steal. Okay, how many have ever taken anything without permission? Well, all of our hands should have went up at that one. Uh, we've already said we're a bunch of liars. Okay, well, we've all done that. And it doesn't have to be a bank. Uh, it could be a pencil in the third grade. Uh, that means that we're a thief, okay? The Bible says that God is so holy, even his name is holy. And that's why one of the Ten Commandments says, you shall not use the Lord's name in vain. Hey, folks, isn't it ironic how uh, now the blessed name of Jesus Christ, the Bible says there's no other name under heaven by which men might be saved, Jesus Christ, has now become a cuss word? Folks, the Bible says that's the sin of blasphemy, okay? And folks, let's be honest. We've used God's name in vain uh, before. The Bible also says in the Ten Commandments, you shall not commit adultery. And Jesus takes the standard even higher. He says, listen, it's not just physical adultery. He says, surely I tell you that if you look at another person with lust in your eye, you've committed adultery in your heart. God looks at the heart. One more out of the Ten Commandments says, you shall not murder. And you might say, well, hey, I haven't done that one. Really? The Bible says that the sin of hatred is akin to the sin of murder. You, in other words, in your heart, wish they were dead. You pulled the trigger, if you will, in your own heart. And the Bible says God sees that, and it's just as bad. He knows the mind. He knows the heart, the thoughts, and the intents that we have. Folks, that's just five out of the Ten Commandments. How are you doing? Not very well. None of us can keep them. They're God's x-ray to show us that we're disqualified. And so when, not if, your time comes, because we're all marching towards the grave at different speeds, you're going to have to stand before God. And you're going to have to uh, say who you really are. He already knows. Hey, God, let me into heaven. Uh, I'm, I'm a liar. I'm a thief. I'm a blasphemer, adulterer, and a murderer. Folks, the Bible is clear. Such people as these will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. That's the problem. Here's the good news. God so loved the world that he sent his one and only begotten son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him, what he did on the cross, on our behalf, that we will not perish, we will not go to hell, but he will give us the gift of eternal life. Jesus died on the cross to forgive us of all of our sins. It's something that we don't earn. We, we, we can't earn. It's a gift, the Bible calls it. And a gift cannot be earned. He was taking the death penalty in our place. That's what the cross was of the day. And that if we would just ask Jesus Christ to forgive us of our sins and believe that in our heart that God raised him from the grave, showing that his death is satisfactory to God to forgive us of all of our sins, no matter what we've done, the Bible says we shall be saved. Uh, the Apostle Paul says that if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the grave, we will be saved. Let me give you a common analogy of what God's doing and what he did for us with Jesus dying on the cross on our behalf. Uh, in life, we know that people uh, can be sentenced for a crime uh, to where they're actually on death row. Uh, the courtroom scene has completely finished. The gavel has already sounded. Uh, they are going to jail and they're just awaiting their time before they go to the death penalty. Uh, as they're sitting there in the jail cell, uh, it, it's a proven fact they did what they did. Everybody knows it. They're just waiting for that time for their uh, number to come up, so to speak, and walk down that hall and be executed. Uh, there's nothing they could do to reverse their crime. No amount of good works in that jail cell can reverse what they've done. It's too late. It's over. But believe it or not, there's one way that people even today can get off a death row. And that's if the one in authority, the governor, 
if he were to, out of mercy and kindness, nothing that the person did, because they don't earn it and they don't deserve it, and they can't earn it, if he would grant them what's called a pardon, out of the kindness of his heart, he has the authority to grant them a pardon and absolve them completely of their crimes uh, against the state. And did you know that there's actually been people that this has happened to, that the governor, out of mercy, has granted them a pardon as a gift, and they've gone down to the jail cell and handed that person, extended it through the bars, here, I'm granting you a pardon. If you would just receive it, you can go free right now. And did you know that there's actually been people who've said, no, I don't want your pardon. And so what happened is of their own doing, even though they had a way out, they still had to go to the death penalty. Folks, can I tell you something? That's what God did for us with Jesus dying on the cross. He sent his son to take the death penalty in our place. He, God, has the authority to grant us through Jesus a complete pardon. And every day that you're still alive, God is extending to you spiritually this pardon. But a pardon does you no good unless you reach out and receive it by faith. Won't you do that today? Won't you call upon the name of Jesus Christ? Ask him to forgive you of all of your sins, to trust in his work on the cross, to pardon us from all of our crimes, our sins against God. God loves you. He wants a relationship with you. But there's only one way to heaven. It's Jesus. There's only one way to get off a death row. It's through the cross of Jesus Christ. Won't you do that right now? Well, this has been Pastor Billy Crone of Sunrise Baptist Church and, and Get a Life Ministries. And if there's anything that we can do for you, uh, please don't hesitate uh, to contact us. Uh, our number, our information will uh, come up here on the screen shortly. And uh, uh, if there's anything we could do for you, please don't hesitate to let us know. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us. And uh, remember, I hope to see you in heaven. God bless. Thank you for watching this presentation from Sunrise Baptist Church. If you would like to send us a letter or any other kind of postage, you can reach us at 1780 Betty Lane, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89156. For more information, you can give us a call at 702-452-8599 or email us at bcrone at getalifemedia.com or you can visit our website at www.getalifemedia.com. Billy Crone and this ministry can also be found on Facebook and Twitter. Join us for services at www.sunriselv.com.